continue our free radical discussion. How many of you took Tylenol this morning? If you did, you took a poison. Everybody takes Tylenol. Baloney. Should be taken off the market. It's the number one cause of fulminant hepatitis due to a drug. Why? Free radicals. Free radicals. Tylenol is acetaminophen. And as you learned, or maybe learned, yes, you would have learned this in form a little bit. You learned a little bit more in biochemistry about the cytochrome P450 system in the liver. Uh, metabolizes drugs, but also uh, can change, change drugs into free radicals. It's oftentimes not the drug, as you know from pharmacology, that actually, when it, you know, that you take does, does the, uh, uh, the activity, it's oftentimes changed in the liver into the active metabolite. Like I think phenytoin fits that kind of category, okay? And so uh, acetaminophen, in terms of the mechanism for its injury, it's free radical, okay? And the organ that it really targets is, of course, the liver, but it also targets the kidneys, but that's another story for kidney when we get to that. And so um, um, drugs can form free radicals. The one they like most, of course, is acetaminophen because it's the number one cause of drug-induced fulminant hepatitis, in the United States. Okay. Now, uh, they asked a board question on where in the liver uh, acetaminophen toxicity uh, manifests itself. I'll show you that in a little bit when I have a picture of the liver and discuss the concept of where in the liver damage occurs, and I'll discuss that concept. The answer is right around the central vein. Um, is where the damage is. So drugs can form free radicals. Anybody know what the treatment is? They do, this would be part one material. Uh, and acetylcysteine, big deal, that's memorization. How does it work? Well, it turns out that, that free radicals have things that neutralize them. Thank God <laughs> we have free radicals that, that, that they get neutralized because they hurt us. Who knows what the, what the neutralizer is for superoxide free radicals? No, the answer is superoxide dismutase, otherwise known as SOD. Superoxide, just think superoxide free radical, superoxide dismutase is what basically disarms and neutralizes oxygen free radicals. Okay, now glutathione, where does that come from, please? Please? The hexose or pentose phosphate shunt, you recall, is what generates glutathione. Also is what generates NADPH, which is the main uh, substance that we use for all anabolic uh, biochemical reactions, things that synthesize steroids, you recall, cholesterol, etc. That you get in biochemistry uh, with Dr. Hansen a little bit more. Okay, so I, I'm sure that you're not totally up on that. But glutathione is mainly made, guys, in the pentose phosphate shunt. That's the end product, and its main function is to neutralize free radicals. Uh, it loves to neutralize drug-free radicals, and it also loves to neutralize any free radical that derives from peroxide. There are many free radicals that derive from peroxide. That, that stuff that you put on your, on your little cuts and stuff, hydrogen peroxide, is fantastic stuff. It breaks down into free radicals that just kill everything in sight. Okay? And glutathione can neutralize it. Okay? And so it gets used up in neutralizing the acetaminophen free radicals. When you give it an acetylcysteine, otherwise known as mucamist, you basically replenish. Glutathione is made out of an acetylcysteine. And so you're giving the substrate to make more glutathione so that you can keep up with neutralizing the acetaminophen free radicals. So you're, so you're trying to keep the glutathione levels up. Basically, that's the mechanism of giving an acetylcysteine. Okay. Because glutathione is being used up by neutralizing the acetaminophen free radicals. So we give it more substrate. It's kind of like methotrexate, the uh, leucoverin rescue, so that you don't get your folate deficiency. Um, the leucoverin basically uh, makes a substrate that you can still make your DNA. Uh, even with a block of dihydrofolate reductase. It just implies the substrate that you can continue to make DNA. So it gets around it that way. 
It's the same similar situation. You're supplying the substrate and acetyl cysteine to make, continue making glutathione so that you can keep neutralizing your acetaminophen, keep the patient alive. Now, that's what they ask on board, not what's the treatment for acetaminophen toxicity. I want mechanisms. Mechanisms. Why is the name of the game on the boards, guys, not what. Why? Not what. Why? That's mechanism. That's also for part two. I taught part two also. Okay. Why? They assume you know the what. They want to know the why. Okay. So always when you're thinking about that's why I'm always explaining why. Why? Why? How? Pathogenesis. Mechanism. That's what they're interested in. Not your ability to memorize things. They know you can do that. Can you apply the information is what they're interested in. The answer to that is yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, carbon tetrachloride. They kind of, they don't, I haven't heard of a carbon tetrachloride question in a long time. So I think that probably has been kind of abandoned. That's seen in the dry cleaning industry. That can also be converted into a uh, free radical uh, in the liver. It formed CCL3, and you get uh, fulminant liver failure with that. They're really interested in acetaminophen for two purposes. One, fulminant liver disease, free radical, and also, along with aspirin, God forbid anyone in this room is taking something with acetaminophen and aspirin at the same time for any prolonged period of time, you might be saying bye-bye to your kidneys right now. Say bye-bye if you're on that, because you are destroying them big time. Free radicals from acetaminophen are annihilating your renal medulla. It only gets 10% of the blood supply, guys. It's relatively hypoxic in your renal medulla. Mm-hmm. And so free radicals are whipping away and knocking off your renal tubules, and of course aspirin's knocking off the vasodilator of your kidneys, which is PGE2. It's made in the, at the afferent arterial, and so that leaves angiotensin II, a vasoconstrictor, in charge of your renal blood flow. Hmm. Not a good combo of angiotensin II controlling your blood flow in your kidneys, and then having acetaminophen free radicals in your kidneys knocking off your renal tubules in your medulla. What are you going to do? We're going to slough off your renal papilla. Or totally destroy your ability to concentrate and dilute. What? Urine. Yeah, it's called analgesic nephropathy, guys. And, and you better believe acetaminophen is big time in it. Okay? So get, get, get yourself a little bit off on the liver and also concentrate on the kidneys also. You can screw that up too. I think that's it for free radicals. I think we've done enough harm with that. Scared enough people with it that took out Tylenol this morning, possibly an aspirin with it. Okay? Remember, it's a cumulative thing, probably over years. So you're safe if you just took it today. Okay, apoptosis is a big, big hot term. I tried reading it in Robbins, and I got totally confused, which means it's poorly written, unless that, or I read ADD really bad, and I just don't get it. But uh, <laughs> I do have attention deficit big time, and I probably, too, because I read it slowly, and then I got a little bit off slowly again. I got a little bit off, but even, even reading it ten times, you know, after I was able to eventually get through it with my attention deficit problem, um, I still didn't quite have a real good grasp on it, okay? Uh, but I can tell you this. What's in your notes is the, is the gist of what I was able to pick up on what op apoptosis is all about. It's programmed cell death, guys. Apoptosis. We have genes, apoptosis genes, that are involved in cell death. And so one of the theories of aging is that we're programmed to die, and that's true. Of course, there's other there's other abnormalities, too, things that we screw up our bodies with, like smoking and drinking and, and uh, that kind of stuff. We can, we can do a pretty good job on, uh, all on our own without in, in, uh, you know, involving our apoptosis genes at all. <laughs> you know, we can just kill ourselves with uh, whatever. So it's involved in, uh, there are genes involved in cell death, programmed cell death, okay? It has lots of functions, normal functions. Uh, one of the biggest ones is uh, in uh, embryology, so it's got a great embryology tie-in. Remember, organs 
initially like our, our small bowel and all that used to be solid. So how did they become, how did they get lumens? Apoptosis. Every time I ask you how, you're going to say apoptosis. Okay, that way you'll get used to saying apoptosis. Are you ready? Okay, uh, guys, what's the, what is our, what's the king of our body? Say Y chromosome. Y chromosome. And say it with pride. Say it again. Y chromosome. Okay. It's not W-H-Y chromosome. Y chromosome. Y chromosome. Because, guys, when our Y chromosome came into existence, from our dads, um, the germinal ridge went the testicle root. Okay. One of those chemicals that came out immediately was mullerian inhibitory factor. <laughs> now, why is, why is it, guys, so important that we have mullerian inhibitory factor from our little testicles and our germinal ridges? Answer is, all those mullerian structures, now let me recite them for you. Uterus, there. Cervix, there. Upper one-third of vagina, there, there. Okay. Gone. Okay, that's why we have no, mal no malarian structures, because of apoptosis working through mullerian inhibitory factor, which was the signal. Mullerian inhibitory factor is a signal. There has to be a signal for apoptosis. What is the signal? The caspases. That's a big word. That's right. And what do the caspases do? Mm, destroy everything. Okay. And so they, and it wraps them up into nice little bundles surrounded by membranes called apoptotic bodies, which are phagocytosin destroyed. And, and what's left over that you can't digest is like a flicin. So apoptosis got rid of our mullerian structures now. What is your women? What is your big letter of the alphabet? X. You should say, say X, please. X. Some people just refuse to do this. They just refuse to do this. Okay? They refuse to play this game. I'm trying to teach you by saying X, that's all. Even though you only got one functional one, the other one's a bar body. That's cool. At least you got some little dumbbell there to work out with. Okay. So, what is so good about apoptosis in you guys? Well, the absence of a Y chromosome caused your germinal ridge to go the ovarian route. And you made a, a factor that knocked off what structures? Wolfian duct structures. Yeah. Mesonephric duct. Well, that would they have developed in you? Oh, epididymis, seminal vesicles, you know, those little, you're the vast deferens. You don't want any of that crap, do you? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay? So they went by apoptosis. What's my thymus look like right now in my intermediate spinum? It's kind of small versus a kid, which is kind of big. So when you do a chest x-ray of a kid, what do you expect to see when you do a lateral x-ray? Big old, there's a lot of stuff going on in that, in that anterior compartment there. What is it? Thymus. What if it was absent? The George syndrome. Very good. What else would they have? Tetany. Okay. Well, what caused our, our thymus is to involute apoptosis. So it's involved in normal embryology and things outside of, you know, when we're adults as well. It's also involved in cancer killing. Apoptosis is a major mechanism for killing cancer cells, okay? And then atrophy, the process of atrophy. When we have atrophy and we reduce cell mass, okay, or tissue mass, most of the time those cells go out by a process called apoptosis. And a couple examples of uh, some of these things, and hepatitis also is a good example. You've heard of the term councilman body. This is a liver and hepatitis here. You see this little very, very eosinophilic cell without a nucleus? This is an example of apoptosis. Do you see any inflammation around there? No. And so it's individual cell death without a whole lot of inflammation around it. It just needs a signal, okay, which it could be a, a hormone or a, or a chemical or whatever. And then that activates the caspases, which are enzymes, and it ends up uh, uh, destroying that particular cell without any inflammatory infiltrate whatsoever. Okay. So a councilman body is a good example of apoptosis. So a lot of times when we have a virally infected cell and cytotoxic T cells come and destroy it, it's destroyed by apoptosis. Okay.
Okay? These are neurons in the brain. They shouldn't look like this. A nice and red cytoplasm and very pycnotic nucleus. That's not a very nice looking neuron. Okay, that's because this patient probably has atherosclerotic plaques in his carotid artery with ischemia to the brain, and it produced apoptosis of his neurons. And so they lost brain mass and had brain atrophy, okay, related to ischemia by the process of apoptosis. So we see that it's involved in good things, embryology, uh, things in normal involution, things like thymus, okay? It's also involved in, in, in pathology, cancer, killing cells that are virally infected or neoplastic cells, knocking them off, those kinds of things. So it has a very, very important role in pathology and very commonly asked on exams. So what's the name of those enzymes that are involved in this? That the, the caspases. Think of Casper, Casper the friendly ghost. Okay, and that's close enough. I'm sure if you saw it as a mass something on, on an exam, you better Casper, Caspasasis. You'd see that, that's the dude. Okay, let's think of Casper the friendly ghost. Never seen him, because I don't believe in ghosts. Ghosts or whatever. All right, a couple pictures. Um, let's talk about types of necrosis now and look at some actual gross and some microscopic, mainly gross, uh, manifestations of uh, tissue damage, which we call necrosis. When we damage tissue and it dies, it's called tissue necrosis. And there's names that are uh, applied to different types of necrosis. Remember I told you that when we have ischemia or a tissue hypoxia, we have no oxygen, lactic acid level builds up in a cell. It denatures everything in the cell that's a protein, including the enzymes, and we ended up with what type of, of necrosis? coagulation necrosis. Well, this is what it looks like in a patient with a myocardial infarction. You can see here that the anterior wall of the left ventricle is pale, so this is a, and we call the gross manifestation of coagulation necrosis. That's called infarction. So when we can see it with our eyes, that's called an infarction. When we look at it under the microscope and we see a tissue that looks like cardiac muscle, but it has no striations in it, it has no nuclei in it, it's very bright red, we see no real inflammatory infiltrate here. This thing is all denatured by, by the increase in lactic acid, which destroyed the enzymes. And so these cells, these tissues cannot be broken down. Neutrophils are going to have to come in from the outside to break these cells down. So when you see vague outlines of what used to be uh, uh, whatever the tissue is or what it's supposed to be, this should have been cardiac tissue. That's called, that's called coagulation necrosis. Okay, and that's responsible for the color changes that we see in this heart. Now, as you know, the uh, divided infarctions is the pale ones and hemorrhagic ones. I think it's kind of stupid. Dead is dead, but they think it's important. And so how are you going to work your way through that? How are you going to think about that? Well, it's basically the consistency of the tissue that determines whether it's going to be pale in appearance versus hemorrhagic in appearance when you infarct tissue via coagulation necrosis. If it's good consistency, and when the tissue dies, including the blood vessels, then when the blood vessels die and the, and the red blood cells are released, they can't really diffuse out into that tissue because the tissue has good consistency, so it'll grossly look pale. And so organs that you would expect to be pale would be, of course, heart, uh, kidney usually is pale, got a good consistency. Spleen, yeah, not a bad consistency, it's usually pale. Uh, liver, which is the rarest of the organs to, uh, to uh, infarct because of a double blood supply, is pale because they have good consistency. But I think you would all agree that bowel has very, very loose textured consistency that would likely be hemorrhagic, certainly a testicle. If it underwent torsion, that's a big board question, a torsion of the testicle question. Um, then that's going to be hemorrhagic. It's very, very uh, meshy. And, of course, the lungs, unequivocally, is going to be a hemorrhagic infarction because it has a loose consistency. And so when those blood vessels rupture, the RBCs can easily trickle out into the damaged tissue and produce a hemorrhagic appearance. Okay. All right, so this is a pale infarction. This is the example of coagulation necrosis. All right, let's look at some more examples. What's this organ? Spleen, and there's an example of a pale infarction. Now, most of these are due to embolization. Now, where do most emboli in the systemic circulation arise? The left side of the heart. 
Okay, so could you name a couple things that could have embolized to this spleen to produce a pale infarct of it, please? A vegetation. Now, don't think rheumatic fever. That's not a good one to pick because the, the vegetations in acute rheumatic fever rarely embolize. They're, they're too small. But infective endocarditis, that'd be another story. Yeah, make a little piece can run through all. Sure. Now, maybe you were thinking mitral stenosis, which is the, which is the usual when you have a, 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 a heart repeatedly um, attacked with the beta group A streptococcus. Then you get mitral stenosis. Then you can get these big old clots from by in the left atrium. Get a little bit of atrial fibrillation. The absolute worst arrhythmia, another board question. The arrhythmia most associated with embolization in the systemic circulation is atrial fibrillation because it produces stasis for one in the atria, clot formation, and then it vibrates in there, and little bits and pieces of clot can come off and embolize. Okay, so usually it could be clot, it could be a vegetation that embolizes, and it could go to little places like the spleen and produce a pale infarction. Okay, what's this called, please? Dry gangrene. How do you know it's not wet? Well, because you don't see any pus oozing off of here. Okay, now if you had played odds on whose, lay, whose foot this belonged to, who would it be? Diabetic. And where do you think the problem is going to be? The popliteal artery. It's going to have atherosclerosis in it, possibly even be thrombosed. Okay, remember, the most common cause of non-traumatic amputation of the lower extremity in the United States is diabetes, because it enhances atherosclerosis. Popliteal artery is a dangerous artery. Next to the coronary is probably one of the most dangerous arteries because it's got a small lumen and you put atherosclerotic plaque in it, whew, you've got a big time problem. Okay. So this is a good example also, this dry gangrene of uh, coagulation necrosis related to ischemia. What was the definition of ischemia? Decrease in arterial blood flow. And what would the pathogenesis of that decrease in arterial blood flow be due to in this patient? Atherosclerosis of what vessel? Popliteal artery. Okay. What's the pathogenesis of this myocardial infarction? Coronary thrombosis. Overlying what? An atheromatous plaque. So atherosclerosis was the, was the thing initially producing the ischemia, and then the lumen got blocked by a thrombus. Okay. Just trying to get you to make sure that you understand mechanisms. Mechanisms. Okay, that's this piece of small bowel. Here's the normal color of small bowel. You can obviously see that this is hemorrhagic. And if we took a section through it, we would see vague outlines of what used to be small bowel. So what's this an example of? A hemorrhagic infarction of the small bowel. You notice that it's a very small portion here. Looks like it got trapped somebody. Would anyone want to venture a guess on what it was trapped into and get that question right on the boards? How about an indirect inguinal hernia sac? Remember, the second most common cause of bowel infarction is, is getting a piece of small bowel trapped in an indirect inguinal hernia sac. The most common cause, you recall, is adhesions from previous surgery. And we do that when we do GI. But you can clearly see this is a small segment of small bowel, and it looked like it probably got uh, incarcerated in an inguinal hernia sac. Okay, notice it's a hemorrhagic infarction. Okay, what's this tissue, please? Lung. And what's this thing right here? It's a hemorrhagic infarction of lung. Notice it's wedge-shaped. Notice that it went to the pleural surface. So would you have an effusion? Sure. you have an effusion, that would be an exudate. You learn that in immunology. Okay, be hemorrhagic. It'd have neutrophils in it. The whole bit. Okay. And if you inflame the pleura, what kind of chest pain do you have, please? Pleuritic chest pain. That's a knife-like pain on inspiration. Comprende. That means do you comprehend? I can speak all languages, by the way. Okay. Here's the embolus right over here in the pulmonary vessel that produces hemorrhagic infarction. Okay, right now all we're doing is, doing is mentioning uh, uh, types of necrosis. We do this all over again when we go through the system. So we'll see the same slide again. Okay, now there is an exception to the rule for coagulation necrosis as being the underlying type of necrosis seen uh, in infarctions. And that exception to the rule, and there's only one, is the brain. When you infarct the brain, and the most common infarction occurs right here, that's why you listen to this area on the, in the neck with your stethoscopes. You're listening for a brewy. That's a, that's a noise that's going to be going through a, 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 a vessel that has a narrow lumen. 
Okay? And if you can hear a brewery, it's usually significantly narrow. See, that's the place, guys, where a platelet thrombus develops over natural sclerotic plaque. It blocks it. You end up with a stroke. It's also the place where little bits and pieces of atherosclerotic plaque chip off and produce transient ischemic attacks. Transient ischemic attacks in atherosclerotic stro uh, uh, disease is just little tiny bits of atheromatous plaque going into small little vessels in the brain, producing motor or sensory abnormalities that go away within 24 hours. That's what they are. Okay. When uh, the brain, as you know, has very little uh, 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 mesh work in it, you know, you can put your finger right through it real easy. In fact, what's analogous to the fibroblast in the brain? The astrocyte, okay, because of its protoplasmic processes. So in a sense, it's acting like a fibroblast. It can't make collagen, but its protoplasmic processes give some structure to the brain. So when we infarct the brain, which hardly has any structure, it just basically liquefies. And so the type of necrosis we see when we infarct the brain is not coagulation necrosis. You're not going to see vague outlines of what used to be brain tissue. It's just going to be a cystic space like you see here. It's liquefactive necrosis. So the exception to the rule for uh, infarctions are not being coagulation necrosis, the exception to the rule is the brain where it undergoes liquefactive necrosis because there's no structure to it, and so it just leaves a hole. It liquefies, it doesn't coagulate. Okay, small point, but I put this purposely together. This is a cerebral abscess over here, okay, and this is a uh, after, old atherosclerotic stroke over here. Both of these are liquefactive necrosis, but uh, this is an example of an infarction that produced this one right here. This is an example of an infection. So we know what... Um, uh, coagulation necrosis is, it can be pale, it could be hemorrhagic grossly. Now we talk about another type of necrosis called liquefactive. And it actually says what it does. Liquefactive means it liquefies. And when I think of something liquefying tissue, the very first thing that comes to my mind is a neutrophil. Because its main purpose in life is to pack us a toast and destroy things with its enzymes, to liquefy them. And so for all intents and purposes, a liquefactive necrosis in most cases relates to an infection where neutrophils are involved, usually acute inflammation, producing an abscess or some type of inflammatory condition, and it liquefies tissue. So when I think of liquefactive necrosis, I, more, I more, most commonly think of acute inflammation related to neutrophils damaging the tissue. The one exception to that rule is a liquefactive necrosis in the brain related to an infarct. Okay, that would be not an inflammatory condition, it just liquefies. But this would be an example of liquefactive necrosis due to an actual infection in the brain. So either way, whether you infarct the brain or you have an infection in the brain that produces an abscess, it's the same process, liquefactive necrosis. This is something you're a little bit more familiar with, an abscess over here. Now you can see that this is pointing, so play odds on what the Graham stain would show. Let's see what you learned in microbiology. You should see gram-positive cocci in clusters. Why are they in clusters, please? Coagulase, okay? And that's why you form abscesses with staph aureus. Coagulase does coagulates. Converts fibrinogen into fibrin, and so it localizes the infection. Neutrophils can't get out because of the fibrin strands around, and that's why you have an abscess. Okay, now what, is, what does uh, uh, strep do? Well, it releases hyaluronidase. And so that breaks down the glycosaminoglycans in your tissue, and so infections spread through tissue. That's called cellulitis. They expect you to know stuff like that. Okay. But from the point of view of necrosis, because this is an infection, neutrophils are involved. What type of necrosis? Liquefactive necrosis. Okay. Here's the lung. Okay. And we see these little yellowish areas here in the lung all over the place. This patient had high fever and productive cough. A gram stone showed what? Gram-positive diplococcus, which was what? Strep pneumonia, the most common cause of bronchopneumonia. Okay? But right now we're just talking about necrosis. So since this is, these are areas of abscess formation in bronchopneumonia due to strep pneumonia, what type of necrosis is it, please? Liquefactive necrosis. Good. Why isn't it hemorrhagic necrosis in a, uh, uh, in a uh, or hemorrhagic infarction? Well, first of all, it should be hemorrhagic, 
and it's pale, and second of all, there's little discrete round things where they, an infarct of the lung would be located where? Right at the periphery in a wedge-shaped configuration. Do you recall that? Hmm? Hmm? Always goes to the periphery, guys. That's why I get pleuritic chest pain. There's no way in God's green earth this can be uh, a, a, a bronchial pneumonia. <laughs> I mean, a, a infarction. No way. It's pale and is round. That's an abscess. Of course, they would give you history like I gave you to know it's pneumonia. And then type of necrosis, liquefactive. Don't you, when you do a gram stain, don't you see neutrophils in a gram stain? Phagocytosis, strep pneumonia? Yes or no? Okay. So that's showing that's acute inflammation, that's liquefactive necrosis. All right, what's this? Let's say it's a fever patient with fever, night sweats, and weight loss. TB. So what will we call this type of necrosis? Granulomatous type of necrosis, okay? Um, I will discuss the pathogenesis of the granuloma. Hopefully it's already been done for you, but I suspect it wasn't. And things like interleukin-12 were not mentioned. Uh, subset, well, one, helper T-cells were not mentioned. Uh, then you weren't, you didn't have a discussion of the pathogenesis of a granuloma or a positive PPD, okay, which is on boards. So right now we're just getting into the concept of granulomatous type of necrosis, another term, cageous necrosis. Very confusing to students. I mean, most people know cagea. Cageous means kind of cheesy, okay? If we, uh, if we squeeze this particular lesion here in the lung, it had a cheesy consistency called, that's called cageous necrosis. What does it really mean? It basically means you either have a mycobacterial infection, any mycobacterium, including atypicals, or a systemic fungal infection, period. That's it. Those are the only things that can produce caseation in a granuloma. Well, what is it? Well, it's the lipid in the cell wall of those organisms. That's giving it that cheesy appearance. It's the lipid in the cell wall. Okay. So, having said that, do you get granulomas and sarcoidosis? You should already know the answer to that. Yes, you do. But are they cages? No, because they're not related to mycobacterium or systemic fungi. Do you get granulomas and Crohn's disease? Yes or no? Yes. Are they cages? No. Why? Because they're not related to mycobacterium or systemic fungi. So, caseation is a term literally... Uh, uh, that, that only uh, is associated with uh, mycobacterial infections or systemic fungal infections, period. No other type of granuloma uh, has caseation with it other than those, those particular diseases. Okay, so caseous necrosis is another one you want to remember. These are foreign body giant cells, okay, and we'll discuss that when we do inflammation. Okay, here's a uh, pancreas. There's a duodenum over here. This is the pancreas. Does it look normal? Say no, because we are talking about pathology. Okay. So you'd always be safe and say, no, it's very abnormal, even though you have no idea how it's not normal. At least it'll help you sound good about yourself. Let's see, I got one right. It's not normal. Okay, what's not? I don't know, but it's not normal. Okay. Now, women can get away with that because they have intuition. They can say, I just feel it in my body. That is not normal. Okay. And they're right. They're absolutely right 99% of the time. Like 99.9% .9 will live my wife. And she had no rational reason for believing it. That's the cool part. God, do I wish I had that gift. All right, so here's the person. Now, where's the pain going to be here, guys? Just to show you how simple this board is. God Almighty, is it simple. They give it away in the stem of the question. So I'm going to ask, let the gastric distress with pain what? Radiating where? Into the back, pancreatitis. Cannot be peptic ulcer disease, guys. The pancreas is retroperitoneal. When it gets inflamed, the pain is referred into the back. Peptic ulcers are not retroperitoneal. So you just have epigastric pain. Totally simple. Totally simple. They put all that stuff in the stem of the question. If you know anything about physical diagnosis, a lot of the systemic pathology questions are, you mean you just get them boom like that. You just literally give it away. So pain radiating into a back, okay, is pancreatitis, for all heads and purposes. So what type of necrosis do you think we are now dealing with? Enzymatic fat necrosis. So it's fat necrosis related to enzymes. What about a woman that has pendulous breasts, okay, and she damages them maybe from running without support, and she gets fat necrosis, 
Okay, is that enzymatic? No, 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 that's traumatic fat necrosis. And can it calcify? Oh, yeah. Can it look like cancer on an x-ray, on a mammogram? Oh, yeah. Does it scare the living daylights out of a woman? Oh, yeah. But what's the difference between that and calcification in a cancer? It's painful versus painless. So traumatic fat necrosis usually occurs in, in the breast tissue or other adipose. But enzymatic fat necrosis is unique to the pancreas because it's the enzymes that are breaking down fat into fatty acids which combine with calcium salts to produce chalky areas of enzymatic fat necrosis. These little chalky white areas, guys, have calcium in it. It's calcium bound to fatty acids. It's called saponification. It's actually forming a soap-like salt. Can these be seen on x-ray? Say yes. Yes, because they have calcium in them. So if they show you an x-ray, some dude that had pain that constantly penetrated into his back, and they show you this x-ray, and you see in the area of the right upper quadrant, these little tiny stifle calcifications in the area of the pancreas, what is it? It's pancreatitis. In a patient who is a alcoholic, there you go. It's is simple little things that they do on these boards. Simple little things. Not hard. Not hard. You make this test harder than it really is. It really isn't hard. Most of it's because you're so stinking nervous because your whole life depends on doing well. If you, if you didn't, if you had all the time in the world, okay, and you could put your feet up and just kind of go la 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 la, you just kill this test because it ain't all that hard. But you throw on top of it a little anxiety, I can see where you can get... You know, just things start getting jumbled up there. I will guarantee you by the end of Friday when we're done here, your level of confidence should be going up. Because I got a lot of the testing and notes right there. Yeah. <laughs> this is what enzymatic fat necrosis looks like histologically. These, wherever you see blue, wherever you see blue in a histologic section, let's say in a coronary vessel, and you know it's atherosclerotic. And you see some bluish discoloration. It's always calcium. Calcium kind of stains blue. It's actually called dystrophic calcification. That's calcification of damaged tissue. And so this is the calcium salt. This little bluish area would correspond with these white areas that we see grossly. This, of course, is hemorrhage. This patient had hemorrhagic pancreatitis. So they could put this picture up there, and they have. And they can ask you what enzyme would be elevated. That was an easy one. Except amylase wasn't listed. Lipase, very good. Okay, which one's more specific, amylase or lipase? Lipase, why? Because amylase is in your parotid glands. It's also in your small bowel. It's in your fallopian tubes. Not very specific, but lipase is only found in your pancreas. That was a board question. Or they could show this and they could say, what type of necrosis is it? You know, enzymatic fat necrosis. But usually, you know, nothing that simple. Usually they could go around into and go through mechanisms. You say, you know, what's the underlying cause of this thing? Answer, alcohol. Produces these little thick secretions in the ducts, and then they end up getting uh, activation of the enzymes, and you end up with pancreatitis. So whenever you see bluish discoloration and say, an atherosclerotic plaque with something like this in the pancreas, you know that's calcium. The last of the uh, types of necrosis of importance is fibrinoid necrosis. Now, what's oid mean? Looks like but isn't. So if there was someone in here that was an exact replica of me, and I don't see anyone that is, then you'd be goyanoid. <laughs> okay? That means if you look like me, but you're not me. Okay, so fibrinoid means it looks like fibrin, but it ain't fibrin. Okay, now I'm, this is just showing you just a panorama of different diseases we will talk about later. Right now we're concentrating on fibrinoid necrosis and what it means. It's the necrosis of immunologic disease. So let me show you some immunologic diseases. Well, palpable purpura. When you, when you see that word palpable purpura, the stem of a question, that's a small vessel vasculitis. Okay? It's, got, it's immune complex type 3. Automatically. So all I have to do is say palpable purpura. Type 3 hypersensitivity. Small vessel disease. Boom. Done. Okay? And fibrinoid necrosis kind of has its immune complex deposition. Uh, in this case, a small vessel. And they also ask, what's the pathogenesis of how immune complexes work? Did you, did you know? Did your, did your uh, immunologist tell you? How do you get damage in type 3 hypersensitivity? An immune complex? You know what an immune complex is. 
Yeah, it's an antigen in an antibody circulating in the circulation. Good. And then where does it deposit? Well, places that the circulation can take it to. Okay, so it could be in a glomerulus, it could be in a, uh, in a small vessel, okay, wherever. How does it work? It activates the complement system, the alternative system to be exact, and it produces, which produces C5A. And what did you learn from, inf uh, from inflama about inflammation? What is C5A? One of its functions. It's chemotactic to who? Neutrophils. So who do you think does the damage of type 3 hypersensitivity? Neutrophils do. And why are they there? Because the immune complex activated the alternative complement system. The immune complex really has very little to do with it other than activating the complement system. It's neutrophils that do the eventual damage. And that was actually asked on boards. This is Hanok Schoenlein's purpura. If you felt this person's uh, legs would be palpable purpura, and this is what their blood vessels would look like. So that's type 3 hypersensitivity. Now someone mentioned rheumatic fever. And there's the vegetations of rheumatic fever along the mitral valve. They're sterile. But if we took sections to them, we would see fibrin-like material in them without any bugs, fibrinoid necrosis. So, the, so it's, the, it's the necrosis of immunologic disease. Okay? Little nodules on the extensive surface. Let's say the person has morning stiffness. Mm -hmm. Has it a guess? Rheumatoid arthritis. And if we took a section to that, what type of necrosis would we say? Fibrinoid necrosis because it's immunologic damage. So fibrinoid necrosis is the necrosis of immunologic damage. Could be in a vessel like a vasculitis. Could be in a kidney like a glomerulonephritis. Don't you think we're going to see fibrinoid necrosis and lupus glomerulonephritis? Good gracious, sure you are. If it involves immune complexes, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Now, what do you see? Say something bad. Bad. What organ? Good. Now, let me show you some anatomy here, and then we'll get to the fatty change, which is what we're really going to be talking about. This is the triad area. Triad means what? Three. So there's three structures. Okay? Portal vein. What's the other vessel? Hepatic artery. What's the next one? Bile duct. Those are your triad. Now remember, the liver is unique and that has a dual blood supply. Okay? And so the hepatic vein and uh, hepatic artery and portal vein will dump their blood where? Into sinusoids. So the liver is an example of a sinusoid organ. What are some other sinusoid organs? Bone marrow. Spleen or also has sinusoids in them, too. That's histology. Okay. What's characteristic of sinusoids? Gaps. Gaps between the endothelial cells where there's just absolutely nothing there so that things can fit through them. Like what? Red blood cells, inflammatory cells, as opposed to glomerular basement membrane, which is fenestrated. That means, it, that means it has little tiny pores right through the cell. Okay, that's little windows that go through the actual cell. Whereas in sinusoids, they have gaps between the, the cells of the endothelium. So actual large cells can get through them. That's not true of the glomerular basement membrane. I mean, it's totally intact, except it's got these little pores, little windows that can go through it for filtration. They're totally different histologically than sinusoids. These are simple little things that are commonly asked on boards that test your knowledge of histology, which is the least important thing on the boards. All right, here's your sinusoids. So, so, so uh, portal vein blood and hepatic artery blood are, are, are dribbling through these sinusoids, and eventually they will be taken up by this little vessel here, which is called the central vein. The central vein becomes the, finish the sentence, hepatic vein, which empties into, finish the sentence, inferior vena cava, which goes back to, right side of the heart. So there's a communication, therefore, isn't there, between the right side of the heart and the liver. Yes? So if you have right heart failure and blood builds up behind the failed heart, what's going to happen to, to, to this little structure right over here? It's going to be congested with blood and we're going to get with the so-called nutmeg liver or congestive hepatomegaly. It's all related to each other. And if you've seen the high yields, you already know they've had MRIs 
where you had to identify where the hepatic vein is. So that was easy because all you had to do was look for that vessel, whatever looked like a vessel going into the anterior vena cava. That was the hepatic vein. And then they asked questions about what if you block the portal vein, what happens to the liver? Nothing. Because it's before the liver. Well, if you block the hepatic vein, but Chiari syndrome, what happens to the liver? It gets really congested. They want so obviously when they ask questions like that, what are they after? Do you know the blood flow through the liver? See? Now, here's a concept. Which part of the liver is most susceptible to injury? Normally, this part around the central vein. Why? Because this part gets first ditties on the oxygen coming out of through the sinusoids. That's called zone one. And then zone two, which would be right about in here. That's where a yellow fever likes to hit. Mid-zone necrosis. Yellow fever. Aedes aegypti. Okay, that'd be here. They get the next divvies on it. And by the time it gets to zone three, which is around the central vein, the poor little dudes don't get nothing. It's kind of like the renal medulla. Getting only 10% of the blood supply cortex gets 90. Well, this is, the, this is analogous to the renal medulla. Notice where the fatty change is. All around zone three. So I'm going to ask you a question. When I asked the question about acetaminophen toxicity, and they asked you what part of the liver is most affected, we will say the part around the central vein. Why? Because it gets the least amount of oxygen, so it really would not have a chance to combat free radical injury. You with me? Concepts. Concepts. What's the most common cause of fatty change? Alcohol. Okay, there's your metabolism of alcohol. Look at it, please. Okay. Now, you're going to go through this. Uh, again, we'll go through it again and get this also in biochemistry. Okay? The big thing I want you to see is NADH is all over the place. And acetyl-CoA. Acetate. Acetate's a fatty acid, guys. Acetyl-CoA can be converted into fatty acids. In the cytosol, remember? Okay. Now... NADHs are part of the metabolism, guys, of alcohol. So what does that mean in terms of biochemical reactions? A lot, guys. What caused pyruvate to form lactate and anaerobic glycolysis, please? The NADH drove it that direction. So what type of metabolic acidosis is always seen in alcoholics, please? Lactic acidosis. Why? Mechanism. The increase in NADH drives it in that direction. And so you know if pyruvate is forced to become lactate, then you also know that in a fasting state, an alcoholic is going to have trouble making glucose by gluconeogenesis because you need pyruvate to start it off. But if it's forced to become lactate, you've got a problem. So you automatically can figure out. And alcoholics have fasting hypoglycemia. Not only that, what else can we make with acetyl-CoA? Ketone bodies. Acetoacetyl-CoA, HMG-CoA, huh? Acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, huh? And which of those two keto acids do you think you're going to see in an alcoholic? Acetoacetic or beta-hydroxybutyric? Beta-hydroxybutyric because it's an NADH-driven reaction. So what two types of metabolic acidosis do you see in an alcoholic, please? You see lactic acidosis because you're driving pyruvate into lactate. And you're getting increase in synthesis of ketone bodies because of the excess acetyl-CoA. And what's the main keto acid, please? Beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Very good. It's got two or three more questions on boards. Now let's get to why it produces fatty change. Ooh, okay. This is glycolysis, guys, around reaction four. We get these little simple intermediates here. And we've got our little friend dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Look at our little NADH reaction. Whoa. And it's forcing it to become glycerol 3 phosphate, which will be a big time board question. You've heard of the glycerol shuttle? Glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle for NADH to get ATP? Well, that's what it's famous for. We know another thing it's famous for. It's the carbohydrate backbone for making triglyceride. What you've got to do is add three fatty acids to glycerol 3 phosphate. Voila, we've got triglyceride. And since we're talking about the liver, what do you think that, that this, 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 this lipid fraction is in the liver? VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. That's where our endogenous triglyceride is synthesized in the liver. From what? Glycerol 3 phosphate. Derived from what? Glycolysis. 
Now this would sound like heresy. Would restricting fast decrease the synthesis of VLDL? Of course not. Would restricting carbohydrates reduce the synthesis of VLDL? Absolutely. Because it's a glucose intermediate that it's made from. Glycerol 3-phosphate is a product of glycolysis. And so you can see why now fatty liver is most commonly due to alcoholism. Okay, because of this reaction here, which is on boards. Okay, 10 minutes.